We've got some ground to cover this morning. As we uh, broke into this last week, as we went through this process of beginning to look at what it is, this My Church Rising campaign, we actually had a couple of things happen this week. Uh, we got our uh, local board of administration and their spouses and our staff and their spouses together um, because I'm not asking you to do something that I'm not asking our leaders to do. Our leaders will do it first. And we have gone through that process together on Thursday night at Tina's house. We went through and uh, walked through all of the different things that are truly, to me, super exciting. Now, I can tell you 20 years ago, this would have been probably some of the most boring things ever. Uh, but, like, I know where our fire hydrants are going to be. And I'm geeked about that for some weird reason. Um, but the, all of those things are part of what we uh, talk through when we have our gathering. So if you have not yet signed up for one of our gathering meetings, all of the different clipboards at the back are different nights and different opportunities for you to do that and invite friends. Okay, We do need to know how many because we are bribing you to come to this with Chick-fil-A unless it's on Sunday. Okay, So... I know that's kind of a, well, what do we do on Sunday? It'll be something good on Sunday too, all right? But uh, we do want you to be there, and uh, don't eat beforehand, uh, but some of them have child care, so if you need child care, make sure you sign up for one that actually has that available, all right? But uh, uh, get signed up for that, and we are continuing to look at what it is that God is asking of us as we prepare ourselves to get before Him and say yes to Him in a way that is maybe completely different than you have before. And so I want you to go to those gathering times. I want you to be able to be there for that um, and uh, hear the questions, ask your own questions, hear those answers, and start walking through with us on that. Today we're continuing. We're actually in Exodus chapter 12. We're going to be in 20. We're going to be in 32. We're going to be covering a little bit here. Um, not all of it, obviously, but we're going to be jumping through. So uh, I want you to kind of join me in this thought process, though, right now. There was an impossible task given to Moses. I want you to think back through all of human history of when an entire nation gained its freedom without ever going to war. Think about that. I struggle to find an example of that other than the people of Israel being released from captivity in Egypt and taken to a place that God gave them. And that is absolutely, completely different than how that had ever, ever happened before and really since. And God gives this crazy challenge to Moses. Not challenge, it's not a challenge at all. It's a, it's a job. You will go do this thing, go Set my people free. If you were Moses in that moment and your entire life experience had led you to understand that nations don't gain freedom without fighting, what would your questions have been for God if you were Moses? This is class participation time. What would you have asked God for? An army, right? Did God give Moses an army? Zero armies were given to Moses by God. None. No armies. Food. Uh, God, I need really tasty, delicious foods if I'm going to go do this thing because I'd have no clue. Uh, that's a great idea, Tim. Tim is providing delicious foods after church. No, he's, I didn't. There are, I mean, to me, that, that would be it. God, I, I need an army. I I have no idea why you asked me to do this, Lord, but if you're asking me, then let's make a deal. I'll say yes if you do this. That was not the conditions that God put on this obedient decision from Moses. Another question real quick. You understand if you've read through uh, the beginning of Exodus, God goes through, and he does not give Moses an army, but he says, you know what I'm going to do? With ten plagues, I am going to convince the Egyptians to let you go. Do you realize that many of those plagues the Israelites had no experience of? The plague of darkness? 
It says that the Egyptians were walking around in this darkness that was so heavy they could feel it. It was a crushing darkness, is what Scripture says. But the Israelites could see just like normal. It's really interesting to me that the amount of protection that the Israelites had from these plagues, you see, because they, they heard on the 10th plague, the Passover, the killing of the firstborn of all of Egypt, all those who were not in covenant with God, they heard that, but they didn't experience it. What happens to us when we don't see things happen? You ever think about that? It's real easy to be very passive about things that are horrific in somebody else's life when it's not happening to us. It's a fact. I mean, this is provable by the fact that there are people in this room who within the last month and a half have lost relatives. And we may empathize with that, but we're not walking every single day with that loss, and so it might completely never even cross our mind in a day. But they're living in that every single moment. Why? It's, not, it's not my thing. That's their thing, and I, I can, when I see them, it reminds me that, oh man, yeah, you are in mourning, you are struggling through some really difficult things right now, but I'm not. I have other things that I'm dealing with, and so my mind shifts to these things because it's really hard to feel what somebody else is feeling if I am not in the middle of that, and I can't help but think that the people of Israel were probably, excuse me, probably fairly completely unaware that God was even at work on their behalf. Now I see, I think that because I see some of their responses as it goes along. We're going to read one of those responses later, but I mean, how often is God doing tremendous work that we just don't see, and so we assume that God's doing nothing? And then when something happens, we're like, finally, Jesus. Where have you been? I mean, I've been working on this hard, Jesus. And he's like, listen, silly. You just... But I think the Israelites were struggling with that, and I say that because of what we're going to see as some of the responses to God as it comes through. But I see this as kind of a typical human reality, that if I don't see it, I don't think about it or believe it. See, it's going to be our intent over the course of the next couple of months and actually the next couple of years. Because it has been, to me, obvious that God has been working, but there have been many times that I've been like, God, I don't see what you're working on, but I'm going to believe that you're working slowly without me knowing about it. And that, that mentality can seep in and kind of change how we think about things. But over the course of the next few months and over the course of the next couple of years, we are going to be giving you regular updates to the point that hopefully you begin to look forward to those updates and maybe by the end of it go, you know what, I've got it. Stop talking about it. I want to talk that much about what God is doing so that we cannot miss it and we can't be passive about these things that he is doing. See, they didn't see much of what God was doing on their behalf. So my question is, what has God been doing on your behalf that you may be completely unaware of? What are you not understanding about what he has been doing? And it is maybe because you haven't been giving him credit for what he is doing. See, God brought ten plagues on Egypt to bring Egypt to the point where without fighting, the Israelites were set free. And then he gave them this instruction. So now we're kind of caught up through the first uh, 11 chapters of, of, of Exodus here. And it says this in Exodus chapter 12, verse 35 and 36. And the people of Israel did as, as Moses had instructed. They asked the Egyptians for clothing and articles of silver and gold. The Lord caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites, and they gave the Israelites whatever they asked for. So they stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. interesting i don't know politically how that kind of connects with us but i do know this the people of israel were enslaved for a little more than 400 years 
during that time, I don't know how much you know about slavery, they didn't make any money. That's how slavery works. You don't get paid for what you do. These millions of people working for no wages, gaining nothing but being blessed by God because it does say throughout that time that they, if you remember 400 years previous, they went there as basically a single family. It was a big family, granted, but it was a single family. There were not millions of them that got captured by the Egyptians. There's just one family. But over the course of this 400 years, this family has blown up so much, been blessed by God so much, that the Egyptians are now terrified of them. And this family now has seen the result of what God has been doing. Maybe not seen all the specific things, maybe not been experiencing them themselves, but maybe watching them from a distance and going, wow, not cool to be you, brother, but that's not my deal. I've got to go take care of some water and of camels or sheep or whatever they were doing. But when it came time, God led them out and said, hey, by the way, just ask. Ask as you're going out, do you have any good, can I borrow your car? Cool, I'm not going to give it back. That's cool. Here's the keys. There's another one. Here's the keys for that one. I mean, if this were happening today, this wouldn't be just like, here's my wedding ring. There you go. Be blessed and go. No, it's like this stripped Egypt of its wealth. And these people, all they had to do was ask, and they did, and they walked out, not only free, but now blessed financially. Which one happened first? The freedom. God blessed them with freedom first, then with tangible wealth. And I think God continues to do that today. I don't think Jesus came to be Santa Claus, right? No, he came to set us free from the penalty of sin and death. To pay the penalty for that, that penalty that we could not pay ourselves because we are dead in our sin. He being the perfect one, the sacrifice, the only sacrifice that we could pay. He paid the price for us and he gives us this freedom. And I think we do the same thing that the Israelites do with freedom. We have no idea what to do with freedom. We're Americans. We know how to be free. <laughs> really? We choose slavery all day long. I need this thing. I'll be a slave to my debtor. I need that thing. I'll be a slave to that debtor. And we give our freedom away all the time. Well, I want peace, so I'll give freedom away. Ooh, come on, people. I mean, this. we are terrible at being great stewards of freedom. The freedom that God died to give you, how often do you surrender that for some trinket or for some garbage relationship or for something that is not what God had in mind for you? He gave you freedom first through His Son, Jesus Christ. I hope you don't come to God like He is Santa Claus. I need this and I want this and I want that and I want this. I hope you come and say, Lord, I accept the freedom you have given me. Anything else beyond that, I don't deserve it. I haven't earned it. I can't do enough good things to serve you. I can't set up enough chairs. I can't tear down enough chairs. I can't run enough anything to make you want to bless me more than you have already blessed me because you gave me your son. Oh, that's all I want. That's not all God gives, though. <laughs> he blessed them monetarily after this. So, a couple of questions that I want you reflecting on. Uh, the small groups will probably be processing some of this. If you're not part of a small group, I forgive you. But, you know, get to be part of a small group. From what is God working to free you right now? Maybe you've already made that decision to follow Him. But maybe you're still living in captivity to something. Maybe it's a way of thinking. Maybe it's an addiction physically. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe there are things that God has said, I want to set you free, but you keep wanting to go back. It's amazing to me how often we read through Exodus that the Israelites complain about their freedom. 
It would have been better for us if we died in Egypt. At least we would have had meat to eat. They weren't a bunch of vegetarians. Not if, I mean, uh, not making a comment about if you are a vegetarian. Just saying, like, they wanted some meat. And God was like, cool, gotcha. That was, that was quail. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if you picked up on that. That was the biblical sound of quail. He did that. Every single day, by the way, God did that. They complained and complained. We don't really like our freedom. We wish we could just be back in Egypt where at least we had a roof over our heads. And God's like, really? That's what you want? You want to be a slave for comfort. Okay. He didn't let them, by the way. <laughs> he had something more in mind for them. From what is God working to free you? And what might he have in store once you are set free? You see, we, like the Israelites, have this idea that the thing that we are captive to is actually good. And God's like, you have no clue what good is until you get good from me. But we wish we were in Egypt still. I wish we were still slaves. At least we'd have this. At least I'd have comfort. And God's like, comfort is for wusses first, but I have way more than comfort for you. So we fast forward a couple of months in biblical time, and let's go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 18 is where we're going to go here shortly. But uh, in that kind of interim time, they've escaped Egypt, they've crossed the Red Sea, they've camped. Now, listen, I just said those things like they were no big deal. They escaped Egypt and crossed the Red Sea like there was some bridge. No, if you remember, like God had to part it. They'd never walked through where there used to be a sea before, but now they have. They camped at Mount Sinai. Moses is up on the mountain with God, receiving his law, and the people stay down in the camp. And there's a time frame for that, but God was wanting the people ultimately to come to him. And he gives that invitation to them, and it says this in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18. When the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountains, they stood at a distance, trembling with fear. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we'll listen, but don't let God speak directly to us or we will die. God did not say that, by the way. The people said that. And they give all of their reasons for it. We saw the clouds and we heard the thunder and the lightning and we were scared. So we don't want to come. You're scary. The God of the universe, the one that could speak it into existence without even having to try, yeah, there's some power there worth fearing, but not the kind of fear that's like, oh no, I'm afraid. The kind of fear that builds a reverence in us. But they said, no God, you're too scary. Talk to that dude and he'll talk to us. And we'll tell him what we think, and he'll tell you, because we don't want to talk to you. You're too scary. And we look at that and giggle and go, oh, silly Israelites. And then I look around the world today, and I have a question. Is it easier for you to have a relationship with God through me than yourself? Because we've been talking about this third person to first person reality. I don't want you to just hear about God from me. I want you to talk to God yourself. I am not your priest. Jesus Christ is your priest. He is God. Go talk to him. Have a relationship face-to-face -face with him. It has been chewing in the back of my brain all week long. What would have been different if the people had chosen to do what God had said, which was come to me? There was a time frame. Let me talk with Moses for a little bit. You guys hang out a little bit away. Once I talk to Moses, give him the law and the correct ways for you to be able to approach me, then approach me because I want to be with you. If they had said yes to that, what would have been different? Maybe I'm not making any sense, so let me ask it this way. Did Moses ever bow down to an idol? Why? He knew God face to face. If you know God personally, 
and then you see some stupid wood thing covered in gold and it's sparkly. Are you going to be like, oh, great. And no, you're going to be like, hey, who carved the donkey? Because that certainly isn't God. I've been with God. He's kind of a big deal. That's not. Moses met face to face with God. It says that he was a friend of God. That was the relationship that God wanted with all of the people of Israel, but they said, mm, see, it's scary. You have the relationship with him. We'll kind of be obedient. But because they did not know God personally, you know what they did go to on a regular basis? Because that room that was supposed to be in their lives for only God, because it was not filled only with God in a personal relationship, they started having room in their lives for all kinds of other crud. See, choices have consequences. That's nothing new. You've heard me say it probably a hundred times before. Hopefully you've heard somebody else say it, but every time we make a decision, that decision, positively or negatively, has consequences. Moses made a decision to be obedient to God and to come into his presence regularly. And there were consequences to that. He was the greatest leader in all of Israel's history because he followed God completely himself. God invites us to come to him, and we have a choice to make. We'll either fearfully approach him or run in him, run from him in fear. Let's jump ahead to Exodus chapter 32, starting in verse 1. Okay, this is after they had made that decision. So Moses goes back up the mountain and is like, apparently your people don't want to talk to you, God. Um, but I'm here. I want to talk with you. I want to know your will. I want to know your desires. I want to know your instruction. And so he spends the next couple of weeks up there with God. And this is what happens a couple of weeks later. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said. Make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. Two weeks. Moses is gone. And all of a sudden, they forget all that God has already done and say, like, hmm, I haven't seen Moses in a really long time. I mean, two weeks, I wouldn't want to be from, away from my wife for two weeks, granted. But, like, I haven't seen my parents in, like, four weeks. Do I believe they still exist? Yes, yes, I do. I do. I am fairly certain they still exist. They are up in Sedona. There's weird stuff in Sedona. I get that. But I fully believe God's got them right in the palm of his hand. And I, um, I've never been like, I need a new father. It has not crossed my mind in the absence of my dad. But that apparently the people of Israel had not had any practice at being free. They had not had any practice at having a spiritual leader. And so immediately they just go to this bad, bad default. You have to understand for the last 400 years, the people of Israel had lived in a place, Egypt, that had gods for everything. And they were now being really introduced personally to the God of everything. There is no need for anything, but they don't get that, and there's this default, and they switch back to it. And apparently, ADHD is not a new thing. They just, oh, let's do that. And then they did. It's also amazing to me the excuses we give ourselves when we don't get what we want when we want it. It is I mean, I, I just do a survey of my own life, and I'm like, oh, I'm not preaching to you right now. I'm preaching to me. God is smacking me upside the head like, man, when I don't get what I want, when I want it, I'm a jerk, <laughs> you know? And it, I hope I don't go this far, but oh. Verse 2, so Aaron said, Take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and your sons and daughters and bring them to me. Let's do a little bit of quick math. I'm not big on public math. I don't like math. Me and math are not friends. 
do general math, so let's do this. There's about a million and a half Israelites at this point. We'll say, I mean, these are some round-ish numbers, so I'm going to go with a simple. One million of those are either wives or sons or daughters, okay? Because the men, there's about 600,000 of them is what Scripture says. So we're just going to round that to a round number of one million. What did it say? Take the daughters of your wives and sons and daughters. Okay, now, one million wives, sons, and daughters-ish. And they all just plundered Egypt on the way out, so they're all rocking new headgear. Like, does you see mine? Yeah, I got this from Fazizlathith. And they're like, mm, that one's pretty. Well, I got this one from Paddle Suit. Great. I, those are, I just made those names up. I don't even think they're Egyptian. But I'm sure they're having conversations about, mm, that's pretty. You got big hoops? Big hoops are in. I, I don't know what conversations they had, but I know this. They had a lot of earrings. And when you put a million earrings together, I'm looking at some of the ladies in here with some earrings, and I'm like, I mean, we, we got a pound of earrings here, minimum, right now. And there's not a million of us. So we're not looking at a minor amount of gold, right? They bring a lot of gold to Aaron to make this thing. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, Oh, Israel! These are your gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. What? You see, this is not an accident. This is not some, like, oh, we didn't know. This was a choice to say, we go away from the God that we knew before. The one we know delivered us. The one we know part of the Red Sea. The one we know did all of those ten crazy plagues, and we make a choice to say, that is not God. Stupid little cow is God. Oh, mighty God. Like, there's not really a spot in my brain for that. But we make choices on a regular basis that go directly against what God says, and we say it's true. And so I can't say we are pure in this of guilt. Let me introduce you to a reality, at least of my life. If it doesn't apply to your life, then you just know it works for me. Okay? And it's this. It's the exponential dumb principle. Super spiritual. Are you ready for how deep this is going to be? Gentlemen, I want you to think back to when you were 16 years old and you got your license. Okay. Alone in my car with my license, I was actually a very sane person. You know why? All I could hear, there were two voices I could hear. I could hear my dad's voice in my head, and I could hear God. <laughs> like, I know I am now driving a missile that can kill people. When you add one other boy to that mix, the exponential dumb principle begins, and what used to be fairly sane now is, listen, there's, there's a possibility that something stupid's going to happen. I don't know if this is an actual, I know it's not an actual world record. I do know that um, for the graduating class of 1993, it was a class record. This guy right here holds the record for most cars passed on Thornydale Road between Mountain View High School and Ina. 17, never getting back in, 17 straight. Why? Because there were three other guys in the car with me. I bet you can't pass this. <laughs> Exponential dumb principle, there were four guys in the car. The level of stupid has now expanded beyond the level of the car. You put a fifth guy in there, more stupidity. Ladies, I don't know how it works for you. Didn't do a whole lot of driving around with girls, okay? I was a loser, all right? <laughs> facts that's all i'm giving today but, but i know when you have two guys in a car there's potential for stupidity you put three in there the country's 
might lose power when three boys are in a car together. It's just stupid. And we have this happening in Israel. Aaron saw how excited the people were. Why did I keep passing cars? Because I saw how freaked out the guys in the car were with me. <laughs> like, literally, that was the sound that was coming out of the back seat. Oh, you thought that was cool. We're going to keep going. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. Wait a minute. Which, which Lord? Right? I mean, at this point, if you're looking in your Bible, that L is capitalized, right? The people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. After this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. See, what we have that this passage is talking about is they try to meld what they have learned of God and what they want to do themselves. Has that ever happened? Oh yeah, it might be happening right now. I think all humans have a tendency to know God. He has revealed himself. It is absolutely impossible if we truly are honest and say, you know what, God, this, this thing cannot exist without something starting it. But I want to do what I want to do. And I haven't heard from God, and his man is gone, so I'll kind of do what he wants me to do, but kind of do what I want to do, and I'll just mix them together and hope that he's good with that. See, we don't get to add to God's word or blend it with our desires. We must surrender to it. Not in part, but in full. Not the, I mean, there are some things in this passage that are just are melting my brain as I go through it, but as I am talking about this, this one is something that I see us do on a regular basis. God, I know what you want, and what you have already provided for me is purity before you. But I really like this this little thing, I don't show anybody else this little thing. I would really like it if you didn't even acknowledge that this little thing existed. Just leave me alone with my little thing, and I will love you, and I will serve you, and I'll do the things you like as long as I also get my little thing. So we're cool like that, right, God? I mean, I give you my peace offering. I give you little hands up in service, but I also do the stuff I want to do. So we're good, right? Here's a little visual I want to Going to run by you real quick. You guys have all been in here now for getting close to an hour. If you haven't had some water unless you're a hydrator and you brought your own water in with you, right? Okay. What if I had a nice, beautiful glass of water right up here and I was going to offer it to you and you're raising it to your lips and I said, wait, wait, real quick, just want you to know, I mean, full disclosure, there's a little bit of poop in there. <laughs> Would you drink it? No, right? I mean, come on. It doesn't matter how little, if even the thought of that is there. You're like, I don't, I don't know if I want to drink water ever again. It could have a little. If that's disgusting to us, why do we think we get to mix half poop and half water and say, here you go, God, this is my offering to you? We don't. It is not all right. When God has cleansed us completely to keep putting junk back in and say, I'm okay with God. Yes, his grace is incredible. Ought we test it? No, we ought not. So Lord, my intent is to not keep going back in the mud. My intent is to not just keep doing the things I used to do. My intent is to accept the freedom you have given me and then practice it in a way that I'm saying I want more purity in my life, not more permission to have crud there and still be acceptable. The Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain. <laughs> Watch this. This is like mom and dad fighting. Are you ready? Your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Who's talking right now? God to Moses. And he says, Moses, your people. And Moses is like, whoa, whoa. I'm pretty sure those are your people. I don't know if that actually happened. It doesn't. 
That, that would be my comeback for God at that point, though. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted down gold and made a calf, and they have bowed down and sacrificed to it. They are saying, these are our gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Man. I love that it does describe Moses here in a little bit. We're going to jump to verse 15. It says, Then Moses turned and went down the mountain. He held in his hands the two stone tablets and, uh, inscribed with the terms of the covenant. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. These tablets were God's work. The words on them were written by God himself. That is cool. When Joshua heard the boisterous noise of the people shouting below them, he exclaimed to Moses, It sounds like war in the camp. But Moses replied, no, it's not the shout of victory nor the wail of defeat. I hear the sound of celebration. When they came near the camp, Moses saw the calf and the dancing, and he burned with anger. See, I think we live in a day where we want to give everybody permission to do anything they want to do, and if you take that permission away or you even respond and say, that's not okay. No, then you're not okay. I get to do what I want to do, and you can't say I can't. All I'm doing is pointing to the fact that it's going to hurt you. Quit being a killjoy. That's our world today, and God's like, no, this is righteous anger. Do you realize Jesus weaved a whip in his anger and cleared out the temple in the New Testament? Anger is not wrong. Telling somebody else that they are living in a way that is destructive is not wrong. Unless, you know, you buy the whole social garbage. He was mad and he burned with anger. He threw the stone tablets to the ground, smashing them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that had been made and burned it. Then he ground it into powder, threw it into the water, and forced the people to drink it. Well, that's stepping all over my millennial toes. God, I don't, I'm a little offended by this. Here's the deal, though. I don't know what your first job was. I know what mine was. I, I mean, the real first job I had was North American Van Lines. And I thought when I got my first paycheck, it cannot get any better than this. I mean, we worked 60-hour weeks, and it was $10 an hour, which was double minimum wage, and I was still in high school at the time, and I'm like, <laughs> so much bank. I thought I was. Now, what did I do first? I went and I bought a suit. I don't know why. <laughs> I also don't know why no one in the whole process said, that's not the right suit for you. This suit would have fit my dad, and he's 6'4". I looked like a 12-year-old in my dad's suit, and I had bought it for myself. I don't know. Who else should have been? Like, the guy that did the measuring, I'm like, now I look at a picture of that suit, and I'm like, what? <laughs> this is terrible. This is, who, that, four of me could have fit in that, but that's what I spent my money on. And then I took the girl out that I was dating at the time, and we went to Star Pass, and we ate food that I hadn't even seen before. And I just threw money around like, this is never going to end. I will always have money. I don't know how you were. That's what I did. I also then bought a truck and thought I was the coolest guy in the world. Here's my question for you, because up to this point in their history, for 400 years, all the people that were alive in Israel had no idea personally what it meant to have freedom or to have money. What was the first thing they decided to spend their money on? A golden calf. I mean, we have only to this point received instructions. Moses had received instructions by God on how to build the tabernacle, but the tabernacle had not been built yet. The first thing the people decided that they were going to spend their wealth on was a false god. Some insignificant completely powerless thing that they thought was cool in the moment. And they didn't spend a little money on it. They spent a good bit of money on it. And so my question for you is this. 
What insignificant thing have you invested in that you've now had to eat? I mean, I know some of us have been in places where we're like, man, I need this thing. Look, they have one. They have one. They ha- I need one. And then you get it and you're like, I super need that money, not that thing. And we have this remorse instantaneously and we realize that I invested over the long term in something that is actually not making my life any better. And Moses burns with anger to the point that he burns this calf, grinds it into powder. Listen, again, we get these little glimpses of Scripture of time, and you think this took him like, this is like making a cake? This is pounds and pounds and pounds of this altar that then he puts in water and makes all the people drink. How many? Million and a half-ish. Did this take 13 minutes to do? No, it did not. Moses burned with anger through this whole process and made it happen so that they would remember, don't put the freedom and the blessing that God has given you into investments that are useless. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand and say, have you ever had to eat something that you invested in? Because we'd all be like, hmm. And so I'm asking you, Maybe you're completely blind to the fact that you have done that. So go to God. Put everything that you have chosen to do before him and say, Lord, is this honoring you? Is this something significant in your eyes that accomplishes your desire in my life? If it does, rock on. And I'm not asking you to find neat little workarounds to try to justify stupidity. I'm asking you to actually submit your life to God and say, Lord, what is fat that can be trimmed? so that I can invest in what is significant for your kingdom that will last long past my life into my children and grandchildren's life. What does that look like? Am I talking about building a church? I happen to be, yes. I'm just saying. Finally, he turned to Aaron and and demanded, What did these people do to you to make you bring such terrible sin upon them? Don't get upset at me, my lord, Aaron replied. You yourself know how evil these people are. They said to me, make us gods who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So I told them, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. And when they brought it to me, I simply threw it in the fire. And out came the calf. So here's my last question. I'm going to leave you with this. What lies have you told yourself and others to justify your decisions? You see, Aaron spends no time or energy at all coming up with a lie. And for some reason, he thinks Moses is going to buy this lie. Now, here's the deal. If God has set us free and we have things in our life that we have been set free from, whether that's addiction or whether that's in itself or whatever it is. You see, before that, we are blind to it until God shines his light of truth into our life. And once he shines his light of truth into our life, we have to make a decision like the Israelites did. I will either choose to see God as God, or I will say, this other thing is God, and I ignore who God is because I don't like his truth. If we take that route, we have to come up with lies on a regular basis. All I did was throw the gold in the fire. It's their fault. And what was even weirder than that, Moses, is then out popped this calf. Some kind of miracle. You know, I mean, we've seen some crazy stuff recently. All those plagues, crazy stuff. Through the Red Sea, woo! We had no water, and God gave us water. That was awesome. You know, this other crazy thing happened. I threw gold in the fire, and out popped this calf. It must be God. Why does Moses have absolutely no patience for this lie? It's because he has been in the face of God, and he knows that hunk of junk is not God. Don't tell me it is. By the way, God told me what happened before I came down the mountain, which is why I came down the mountain, you nerd. Don't give me your lie, but we justify 
our lives. So what lies have you told yourself and others to justify your decisions? If God has set you free and you are still lying about stuff, you are choosing falsehood when God has freedom for you. So what lies are you choosing? What American lies are you choosing? Get your toes out. Ready? Well, they did it, so I can do it too, right? There's an American lie. I should be able to do what I want. I have free will. I have all this stuff, and I've worked hard for it. I get to do what I want with it. Everybody else has one. I want one. Well, you can't take it with you, so you've got to blow it now. Enjoy it. Hmm. See, I think God calls us to be stewards of all the blessings he has given us. They are not just for us. God never gives a blessing for just the recipient. It's for everyone around that recipient. It's for all nations, ultimately. God chose to be in relationship with the Israelites, and he said, you will be a blessing to all nations. This blessing is not just for you. My blessings go beyond. And so if we take God's blessings and use all of that only for us, we are not following how God functions. We are not being obedient to who He is. We, we are not being disciples, followers of Him. Jesus didn't come to have the next coolest thing. He came to give us completely His life so that we could be set free from that bondage, from whatever addiction, set free from the lies we tell ourselves that justify those addictions so that we can understand the fullness of the blessing that he has given us through his son and then beyond just his son. We have been blessed. That's a fact. We got freedom before we were born. Somebody else fought for our freedom. People still fight for our freedom today, but because we're not doing some of that, we can kind of dismiss it like it's not happening and freedom's just a given. It is not. Jesus died for your freedom. And that's the ultimate. And then he says, but I have even more. I want you to learn how to function in my freedom so you function properly with my blessing. I want you processing some of these questions I've asked today. I want you to get before God, not like for 30 seconds and be like, mm, I prayed about it. Mm. No, like actually get before God. Actually spend some time on that. We are actually going to, I want you starting to prepare for this. I want you to start reading about this. Um, do some biblical study on this because the first week of March, we're going to, I'm going to challenge this church to pray and fast. You're like, I don't like to fast. I like to eat. <laughs> Me too, which is what makes it a sacrifice. Okay, so let's, eh. I want you thinking about that. I want you praying about that. I want you researching why and how to fast. We're going to talk through some of that, but we're going to fast for a specific purpose so that we are one and unified before God and we can hear from Him because we discipline our physical body to engage in a spiritual reality of prayer. Okay, that's coming later. Think about it, pray about it. I want you to join us in it. I'm not mandating. I'm not going to come to your house and be like, mm, I saw that French fry. I, that's not, it's not my deal. But I want you working through these questions when we have our small groups going. I want you leaning in on some of these things and lay it before God and ask Him, Lord, what lies am I telling myself? What am I justifying in my own life and how I use the blessings that you have given me in ways that are not glorifying you and maybe are going towards absolutely insignificant things that I'm still eating, God. What do I need to do with that? I want you praying about that, okay? Let's pray. Father, you are good. Thank you, Lord, that we get to come into your house. We get to come into your presence because you have given us the freedom to do so. And it cost everything that was valuable to you and you give it to us freely god that amazes me lord i pray that you will 
guide us in this process as we are asking these questions, as we are leaning in to what it means to be followers of yours, of what it means to join you in repossessing Tucson and all of Southern Arizona. God, I pray that you will speak to us, that we will move from third-person conversations about you to first-person conversations with you. Lord, thank you for the freedom you have given us and thank you for the blessings you have given us beyond that. Lord, we want to be proper stewards of all that you have poured out on us. Lord, if there is something in our lives that is displeasing to you, I pray that you will put your finger on it right now. That we wouldn't be able to wiggle out, that we wouldn't be able to give justification, but that we would surrender to you. That we would face the decisions we have made ask for the forgiveness that you give and turn our lives over to you and say, God, I will make that decision in a way that honors you the next time I have the opportunity. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word. Thank you for how you are moving in this church right now. Holy Spirit, continue to speak. Convict us. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We continue to praise you now in the name of Jesus.